Yeah, welcome back to the class. Uh, we are discussing um, uh, Professor Sujata Patel's uh, introductory essay in the book uh, Doing Sociology in India, Genealogies, Locations and Practices. Uh, this is an important uh, uh, volume, important contribution that uh, very critically looks at the genesis and development of sociology. So, in the previous class, we were looking at how uh, uh, she argues that even though there is a, there is a consensus that uh, sociology and anthropology in India uh, are indistinguishable or they are used interchangeably. She argues that there is a need to disentangle this more looking into how you know colonial enterprise specifically shaped a discipline like anthropology and how uh, say the ideas of modern nation state and modern society influence the contours of uh, sociology. So, we were discussing the first part of the introductory essay in the previous class. So, let us complete this um, uh, essay in this present class. So, the second part of this essay she has titled as uh, Nations, Nationalism and Sociological Traditions, Nations, Nations, Nationalisms and Sociological Traditions. So, uh, in the context of creating a global cosmopolitan theory, social theorists uh, have recently raised some seminal questions regarding the imprint of the idiom of nation state, nation in classical and 20th century sociological thought. Much in the same way as the discussions on colonialism and anthropology proceeded, social theorists who have termed this imprint methodological nationalism have deliberated the ways in which it has framed and organized sociological knowledge and carried it with the assumption which worked to structure sociological inquiry. Though sociology was structured through the prism of the nation, nation state and nationalism, sociological theories ignored these intellectual moorings and universalized its language disregarding this history. So, what they are actually talking about in this particular section is trying to um, understand some very interesting debates about how uh, say uh, society was conceived of in the era of modernity or, or in the modern era and then how uh, globalization for example that brings in a paradigmatic shift in, in that particular argument. Uh, in other words, there is an argument about methodological nationalism being uh, the feature of a modern society. Uh, and uh, uh, the need to shift that framework into methodological cosmopolitanism. Okay? So, I will just spend some two minutes to explain what it means. Uh, in methodological nationalism, uh, which was uh, according to these scholars was the most, uh, uh, most prominent or dominant uh, you know, paradigm, it assumes that a, a uh, society is confined within the uh, boundaries of a nation state. Okay? A nation state is seen as the container within which the society function. So, when you talk about Indian society or when you talk about uh, Indian economy for that matter, within the framework of uh, you know methodological nationalism, you assume that all the economic, political and social relations and dynamics of this society is more or less confined within the nation state, okay, within the boundaries of the uh, geographical boundaries of the nation state. The nation state is seen as a very overarching container, overarching, overarching boundary within which the uh, inner dynamics of the society takes place. So, uh, with the dawn of globalization, uh, scholars like uh, you know Ulrich Beck, for example, he is a very important champion of that argument. He would uh, argue that uh, this era of methodological nationalism is over because nation state has become less effective and the the national boundaries have become porous. Okay. National boundaries have become porous, national boundaries have become uh, flexible and many times they have become redundant because uh, you know the, the digital communication, the digital networks do not you know really follow or respect the national boundaries. So, there is a huge intense uh, transmission of ideas, materials, you know knowledge system, news uh, across the, the, the national boundaries. So, the sovereignty of the nation state with respect in terms of, of protecting its, its uh, you know, boundary as in, in a very hard man that has been compromised. So, that is a major debate in, 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 in anthropology of, of uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the globalization uh, studies. So, uh, Sujata Patel is, is invoking those ideas and try, trying to see to what extent uh, the sociological theories were uh, confined or concerned with this kind of understanding of methodological nationalism. Or in other words, to what extent sociology was uh, mindful of the kind of a larger relation between nation and uh, nationalism. Okay. nation and nationalism and the society because they are not one and the same. Okay. They are not one and the same. There could be multiple nationalisms within a nation 
especially a country like India, there are multiple nationalist aspirations uh, of, of different regions, but we were able to maintain the national boundary of India uh, intact to a large extent by various means of negotiating, sometimes, you know, violently repressing or sometimes, you know, conceding to certain certain demands or, or sometimes, you know, taking uh, through through the language of development. The, the, the nation state was able to maintain its, its uh, kind of a boundary. So, that is the kind of question that she is uh, analyzing here. In the most straightforward usage, methodological nationalism implies coevilness between society and the nation state, something as I mentioned earlier. That is, it argues that the discussion of the modern society, which sociology does, entails an implicit understanding of the nation. Okay? So, when you, if you are talking about the society, you are also talking about the nation, because uh, you cannot think about uh, society uh, outside the framework of nation state. Or in other words, the nation state, nation is treated as the natural and necessary representation of the modern society. Okay? So, the nation is C is treated as the natural and necessary representation of the modern society. Methodological nationalism is taken for granted belief that nation state boundaries are natural boundaries within which societies are contained. Okay? Something that we just mentioned as a nation state works as a kind of a container. Sociology according to Beck assumed that humanity is naturally divided into a limited number of nations which on the on, on the side organize themselves as nation states and on the outside set boundaries to distinguish themselves from other nation states. This outside limitation and competition between nation states present the most fundamental category of political organization. The sociologist's vision of culture and politics, law, justice and history represents that of individual nation states. That is how uh, the, 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 the conventional wisdom of a modern society emerges and Beck himself argues that uh, that uh, in the era of globalization, this is an old story which needs to be changed. But again, we now know that the kind of earlier uh, optimism that people had about about uh, globalization seems to be uh, misplaced. Okay, the the, the nation state uh, is not 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 going to wither away. Nation state is not going to lose its significance. It's 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 here to stay. So, did sociological traditions of post-independence India frame themselves in similar ways? Okay as uh, a kind of a coevalness between society and nation. The post-independent Indian state initiated expansion of the system of higher education in order to redress the imbalances created by colonialism and to create pathways towards modernity. This policy drew its inspiration from the nationalist thought. No wonder most Indian academics were supporters of this program and actors and deliberators with the state in its higher education policies. It led to the institutionalization of a close functional relationship between Indian academia and higher education and by extension between project of knowledge creation and that of nationhood. We, we know that how, uh, say, uh, you know, uh, there was a huge focus on Indian education system, uh, IITs were established, a new university system was established. So, it was all emerging from a vision to create a more vibrant and educated and wealthy nation. The sociologists in India, unlike those in Europe and United States, were neither blind nor ignorant about the significance of the nation state and nation of the nation and the nation state. Rather, they were enthusiastic supporters of the project of higher education and the particular roles that the state demanded that they play with the higher education system as sociologists. For example, Srinivas and Panini declared, we are convinced that their sociology and social anthropology's growth was intimately influenced by nationalism. This agenda entailed a need to professionalize the discipline and organize it within the territory of the nation state. In this context, two stands of methodological nationalism mentioned above, that of territorialization and naturalization became in the new ways symbiotically linked with each other to become an integrated part of the transitional sociological thinking in India. Okay? So, disciplines are closely associated with the official discourse and methods of understanding the relation between nation state, uh, between nation, nation state and modernity. And uh, so, the, the territorialization of the society with that of that of, of the nation and its naturalization became very important thing and sociology according to uh, uh, Sujata Patel became a very active party to that. Uh, it self-consciously proclaimed a methodological nationalism as its project. Thus, this sociology was particularistic, unlike some of the colonial variants which posited a universal sociology insofar as it constructed a sociology of India as an Indian sociology and equated Indian society with the territory controlled by Indian uh, state. So, uh, uh, this is a very important claim about how Indian sociology was emerged and how Indian sociology uncritically uh, accepted 
or uncritically was bought into the larger narrative of nation state that Indian society is nothing but the, 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 the landmass and the people controlled within the geographic boundaries of Indian, uh, Indian state that uh, constitutes a natural society uh, that constitutes uh, a kind of an organic society within the Indian nation state. So this is this so this uh, uncritical ac uh, acceptance of, of that is something that uh, you know uh, Professor Patel uh, highlights. The late 1960s and 70s were critical years to understand these developments and the making of the discipline. These trends played a significant role. First, the university became main and the only site of organizing the practice of discipline. Of course, uh, the universities were required and, and universities were possible only with the financial help from the state. Uh, phenomenal expansion of higher education. So, she, she, she talks about uh, uh, the, the very, very rapid rise in, uh, you know, university departments and, and uh, uh, you know, people and, 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 and others. Uh, there was an attempt to standardize and make uniform corners of the knowledge governing the discipline wherein three institutions play, uh, played a key role. Uh, UGC uh, and then uh, second one was this Indian Council for Social Science Research and uh, third one the kind of its own group and, and there is no coincidence that the state demanded sociologists together with other social scientists develop and organize systematic knowledge about contemporary society as it responded to planned social change. Most sociologists affirmed a need to have a sociological language that can comprehend the uniqueness of Indian nation, its culture, its civilization. Sociologists in India saw this project as which they analyze one's own society, one's own indigenous own terms without colonial and now neo-colonial tutelage. So, we will just come back to here. Let us see here. Uh, so, she is talking about how um, these major institutionalized structures of UGC and ICSSR came into picture and how uh, Indian, uh, yeah, and the third one was the Indian Sociological Society as a professional uh, body was uh, formed uh, and, 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 and how it had the state patronage and, and other things. So, now, uh, this project allowed for the institutionalization of a particularistic problematic and assessment of the changes occurring within India's characteristic institution, caste, kinship, family and religion. This particularistic problematic had much in common with the notions of India embedded within the elite and mainstream nationalism. Thus, if colonial heritage was a key element that structured these efforts, the need to examine how modernity and modernization in the context of Indian building, of, in the context of nation building, were organizing the changes occurring within the institution, family, caste, kinship and religious fueled its energy. So, what is the argument here? The argument here is that sociology almost, uh, you know, bought in into the language of nationalism and nation state and wanted to, uh, wanted to serve the larger purpose of understanding the transformations of Indian society in the era of modernity. So, they wanted to, uh, so the, the particularistic problematic that Indian sociology was concerned with or the most central theme of inquiry that uh, Indian sociologists were concerned with was how the transition or transformation of traditional Indian institutions of caste, kinship, uh, religion and family. And, and that was the agenda of the nation state and, and, and that was also supported and facilitated by the, by this, uh, by this Indian, uh, by the discipline of sociology. On many alternatives that the discipline inherited from the early 20th century experience that was ultimately institutionalized as standard and uniform language to examine as a social change in modern uh, India and uh, uh, was the perspective provided by M. S. Srinivas. Uh, Srinivas has an essay with the same title. Srinivas's perspective was extremely well placed uh, to be incorporated as a standard variant. It was modern in, in that it promoted field view empirical investigations against the book view, Indology associated with colonialism. We will discuss these terms uh, later. At the same time, it continued the earlier ethnographic approach of studying communities now as segmented groups of jatis and castes. Simultaneously, it was indigenous in so far as it introduced participant observation as an insider's perspective of doing sociology. Last, it was closely affiliated to the elite Vishnu, Vishnu society. The key leadership roles Srinivas and his colleagues at the Department of Sociology of Delhi University took in the various institutions mentioned above also legitimized the universalization of his sociological vision with other positions being pushed into the margins. So, uh, this is a very important observation that she makes that how, uh, you know, uh, uh, Srinivas put forward this argument about how Indian society modernizes and in order to understand how Indian society modernizes, uh, he, uh, you know, popularized this particular practice of participant observation or a very uh, in-depth 
uh, analysis of, of a single village study okay, through participant observation and ethnographic work. So, that became a, a model for others to emulate. So, uh, 1970s, 80s and even up to 90s, this became the most dominant model within uh, sociology. And she says uh, it became a master narrative and uh, uh, you know, social anthropology of Srinivasian perspective was designed to represent the language of sociology. So, that is another very interesting, you know, um, shift that she identifies. Okay, instead of simply saying from the beginning sociology and anthropology have been one and the same, she identifies the very specific junctures, very specific moments in which, uh, you know, anthropological method came to define sociological practices. In what way did sociologists in India react to this process? By the late 70s and early 80s, it was clear uh, to some sociologists that the discipline was caught into problems. For so many, for many, this problem was related to the methodology being used, that of participant observation. Sabarwal was one of the first to criticize the sole reliance on participant observation to study social change in India. The latter does not follow, he does, does not allow, he argued, its use to present a theoretically and methodologically challenged perspective to assess and examine the complex processes of conflict and consensus at work in India. The discipline needed the language that can study the complex macro interface between groups and processes which often were in relationship of involution. So, uh, the very important uh, set of criticism emerged against uh, this participant observation or, or a single village study uh, was first, uh, you know, uh, voiced by Satish Sabarwal a very important uh, sociologist and, and he questioned this very, very, very methodological framework of, of participant observation. And uh, there are other criticisms by uh, T.K. Uman and then, uh, you know, Dhanagri and others. Um, for Sabarwal, the problem was also related to the ways, uh, the way methods of participant observation was conceptualized and institutionalized across departments within the teaching and learning process with non-trained teachers as interlocutors of the teaching process, increasing description rather than analysis dominated the teaching of this method. This pattern got inflated with the simultaneous expansion of departments. So, so oh, participant observation becomes a very easy, uh, even to a large extent, even lazy way of doing things. Uh, a scholar goes out and then describes and then comes back and it many times it lacked the kind of rigor that is required, the, the, the kind of a rigorous conceptual framework was missing. So, there are quite a lot of you know, problems that these people uh, identified. Thus, the expansion of universities bred its own contradictions such as above. The latter were reinforced due to disparity in accessing physical and human resources, differential structures of academic autonomy, these being dependent on universities' legal character, that of it being a state or a central university. Thus, the central universities were better funded, more autonomous and had a national character. State universities needed to project a regional identity as less funding and low staff strength. This process became more complicated with further expansion of state universities and the growth of new state elite demanding that the state universities teach in the language spoken in the region. Unfortunately, there was little or no intellectual investment to create a vocabulary of social sciences in the regional languages. In these circumstances, this demand further impinged on the quality of learning process. So, so she uh, tells a very, you know, sorry state of uh, the situation in, in the more recent time. Uh, and, and maybe things are changing very fast nowadays. So, uh, an evaluation of the current phase might be even more shocking after some time. The way in which, uh, you know, social sciences are losing its significance is something very, very shocking. But when she's talking about the uh, late 80s and 90s, she says there was a huge expansion of, you know, higher education and uh, disciplines and departments across the place. And uh, there was a huge gap between the quality of these places. There are a few uh, elite national universities emerge. Uh, including, say, uh, JNU, then Delhi University, Hyderabad Central University, which had a kind of a national character. Central University emerged, which had a national character because you have people, students and faculty from across the country uh, and, and which, which had a much higher standing. And uh, local universities at a much lower level, uh, more homogeneous, comprising of faculty and students only from that particular regional, uh, you know, uh, uh, from that particular region. And many times even forced to teach sociology in, in vernacular languages, okay. And unfortunately, um, there is no vocabulary or there is no material, there is no literature available. So, so there is a huge, you know, uh, chasm in terms of the quality between these uh, institutions of, 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 of national level, the elite or the center in uh, university that occupy the center position and the, 
universities occupy the kind of a periphery or 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 the mafusal kind of character increasingly the sociologist ethnographic teacher within departments encourage doctoral students to use insider descriptive perspectives to generate monographs of my village or my community over time learning sociology became a soft experience if sociology in india could boast some of the best in the field it was also producing a large mass of professionally untrained students and this teachers researchers in this volume we discuss the narrative yeah so uh, this is a very critical take on uh, you know maybe you can say it as a decline in the in in, in the quality um, of the discipline uh, there have been quite a lot of discussions seminars uh, you know debates about why the quality of sociology came down practice of sociology came down or the huge disparity between the between the regional and uh, you know central uh, places so so this is a take into that so that is the context in which uh, uh, you know uh, let us see this paragraph as well then we'll conclude these contradictory trends and avowed interest in create a theory of social change to assess modern india while contrarily standardizing a perspective that cannot methodologically grasp these very processes and avowed interest to create a theory of social change to assess modern india while contrarily standardizing a perspective so you 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 don't allow multiple perspectives you don't allow kind of larger macro perspectives to thrive rather you use only one particular uh, you know mainstream perspective that is a participant observation to do that secondly a stated obligation to create an endogenous theory and an inability to institutionalize a professional culture to aid this growth uh, there is an obligation to create an endogenous theory uh, a theory that comes from uh, within and inability to institutionalize a professional culture that requires uh, the, the 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 request to provide the kind of an intellectual stimuli uh, to that the genesis and a commitment to the project of the nation state and to elite notions of nationalism when nation was breaking into its many fragments structured uh, structured this distinct responses that were articulated among various departments of society so these uh, factors uh, these three important factors according to uh, you know so jada patel really depicts the kind of a challenges that a discipline like uh, uh, sociology faces and obviously this is not only uh, the uh, challenges faced by sociology but this is also true with a host of other uh, social sciences uh, in terms of how uh, the it, it it interfaces with the nation state and how uh, it is brought into it's brought into the the larger project of national nationalism at the same time uh, you know is for is is uh, unable to uh, to to understand various other you know manifestations or aspirations or dynamics within the society so this latter part uh, the remaining part of they say uh, i think we are not doing because it's all uh, you know very specific uh, analysis about different uh, uh, universities different departments there is an essay on uh, center for the study of social systems that is jnu department there is a uh, essay um, uh, on on bombay school there is an essay um, on um, you know on, on karnataka by professor jayaram so so we are not going into those individual uh, uh, you know uh, essays okay so this uh, uh, two essays combined i feel must have given you some uh, uh, some insights about how social justice discipline emerged and what are the major kind of uh, concerns theoretical ideas and debates that uh, kind of structure the the nature of sociology in um, uh, structure the genesis and the further development of sociology and anthropology in india okay so we are concluding this uh, session and we'll come up with the next session in the coming class thank you